also wanted to add, speaking of community and welcoming, uh, Kirby of Knife Work Book was very kind enough to include this event under the umbrella of um, the Fertile Festival for new innovative, new and innovative works. Uh, so I just sort of wanted to give a shout out to Kirby uh, and, and thank her for all the work that they've done. Um, if you haven't been by the festival yet, uh, please check out the remote gallery. I think there's sort of sitting times all week and there's events coming up on the weekend. Uh, you can take a look at their website for a little bit more uh, about what's happening there. So this evening's proceedings will follow in two sets. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the book. I'm going to read a truncated version of the intro, trying to sort of cut out, you know, perhaps the less interesting bits. Uh, and then we have, we're going to follow that by two sets um, of readers, and we'll sort of take a break at the midpoint. Does that sound okay? Is everyone doing all right? <laughs> How much choice do we have? <laughs> I mean, I like it to look like a democracy. <laughs> they all are there. <laughs> so I'd like to now turn to Border Blur Poetics, which is the book that we're here to launch this evening. Um, I began working on this book years ago. It was drafted first as um, my thesis, and Woo! sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and along the way, the, the book has shifted a lot. My priorities have shifted with that kind of work. It's, it, I would say, it's significantly different from from the thesis project. So I'm really happy to have it in this world, uh, in, in this form now. I think it's. It, it's Hopefully, you know, putting the spotlight on the right people, on the right kind of work, and, and that's really, really important to me. Um, along the way, I benefited immensely from the support and guidance uh, of my mentors, primarily Stephen Kane, Andy Weaver, and Lily Cho. Uh, thanks, Andy, for being here today, wrapping the team. I think Stephen's on his way. He's coming. Yeah, he's coming. <laughs> when he gets here, we'll all applaud. Hi, <laughs> Tyler. Um, Come on in. Um, but I do want to say, just sort of off the bat, and I guess I'll have to tell him this privately, uh, I want to extend a special thanks to Stephen, who's my mentor and friend, uh, who believed in me in this book, and I, I don't think I could have finished it without him. Uh, I also want to thank a lot of you in the room, you know who you are, um, for supporting me during the work on this project, providing me feedback, listening to me worry, encouraging me, sharing your stories, loaning me books from your library, or just generally being a kind, supportive, and good community member. Um, I'm really grateful to all of you in the room who sort of supported me along the way and, and helped bring this book into the world. It really is a community effort. Uh, the book itself, in traditional academic style, uh, begins by introducing the topic, border blur, laying out the context, developing some key ideas, and from there, there's three chapters that sort of look at examples of concrete, sound, and kinetic poetry. Uh, and it concludes with a look at the present, uh, where border blur has gone on since 1988, with really an emphasis on border blur poets who are emerging sort of uh, as we speak and developing those practices. Uh, so we're going to now read a, a truncated version of the first few pages. It's less than 10 minutes. I don't want to do that to you for too long. <laughs> uh, but I think this introduction to the book sets the stage and hopefully it might provide a little bit of a frame for the work that we're going to have uh, coming forward after this. So it begins with um, the book begins with a quote from Dick Higgins, uh, who writes, but there is always an avant-garde in the sense that someone somewhere is always trying to do something that adds to the possibilities for everybody. And I think that uh, the, the writers that I look at in this book, the artists, the performers, really did try to do that, are doing that kind of work, right? Adding to the possibilities for everybody. And I really sort of want to underscore that as what work it does. Um, so I thought that was a, a fitting way to, to introduce the book. This is the death of the poem as I have faithfully reported it November 29th, 1966, that I have reported it. This is the death of the poem in Tom's Canadian poet B.P. Nichol one day after the Dominion Day celebrations marking Canada's centennial year. Um, I begin by describing a, a video that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with of, uh, of Bill Bissett and B.P. Nichol and Phyllis Webb sitting at a table 
um, on the television show extensions, reading their work and talking about their poetic. So I, I meditate on that video uh, um, at the beginning of the book. Addressing a national television audience, Nipple reads these lines with poets Bill Bissett and Phyllis Webb, who chant the words obituary and mortuary alongside him. This poem was published in January 1966 in issue one of Nichols' mimeograph publication, Drunk. It declares that the poem is dead, signifying for Nichol the potential for poetry's rebirth. After the poets conclude their chant, the camera cuts from a close-up of Bissett to a shot of all three poets sitting at the studio table. Webb instructs Bissett, who wears a grotesque mask with a knife protruding from his neck to take off your mask, Bill, and join the group. <laughs> <laughs> and in doing so, as Catherine McLeod recognizes, Webb symbolically unmasks the strange identity of the new Canadian avant-garde for the literary public. Announcing poetry's demise and subsequent generation, this episode marks a meeting between Canada's literary public and an emergent generation of avant-garde writers who proclaim a poetics that secedes from established literary traditions. Nicol and Bissett televise the advent of an expansive, liberated, intermedial poetic they call Border Blur. Taking Border Blur as its subject, this book combines archival research, historical analysis, canon intervention, and literary criticism to trace the poetic's emergence and proliferation as a significant but underexamined node of avant-garde activity in Canada. Nicol and Bissett delivered this performance at the ages of 22 and 27, respectively, on the CBC program extension here, now, and then. The show was hosted by Webb, a well-known Canadian poet and public intellectual. Airing during Canada's centennial celebrations in the summer of 1967, Extension featured the nation's established literati alongside some more emergent personalities. Each episode was an experiment in the staging of poetry in distinct contexts and manners, with poetry presented through film, theatrical readings, conversations at a table, and even at a piano. As avant-garde writers, Nicol and Bissett were well suited to a multimedia presentation of poetry. With cameras directed at them on a sound stage, a reel-to-reel -reel tape player in the foreground, books, magazines, and papers spread across the table, and the drawings and poems tapped on the walls. The studio space reproduces the distinctive multimedia characteristics of their work. They sip coffee and smoke cigarettes while Webb guides them through a conversation that touches on the influence of Allen Ginsberg, the rock and roll of Mick Jagger, the protest songs of Bob Dylan, and the music of Jerry Walker all while weaving in discussion of their poetry's polyphonic qualities, the destabilization of Western reading practices, diverse uses of media, and the implicit forms of social engagement. For Canada, the 1967 centennial signifies a historical turning point, a coming of age moment for the country and its cultural identity. I imagine that viewers who tuned in for Extension's investigation of the nation's poetry one day after Dominion Day might have been perplexed by Nichols' poetic eulogy, Bissett's grotesque disguise, and their discussions of new music, intoxication, and alternative lifestyles. While the show is meant to take the pulse of Canadian letters, Nichols and Bissett ultimately offer their viewers evidence of an emergent poetic milieu distinguished from Canada's existing national literature by its playfulness, penchant for experimentation, and internationalist attitude. Given Webb's penchant for innovative and avant-garde poetic forms, it's hardly surprising that she pushes deeper into the fray. She asks them, is, it, is there any real point to trying to affix a label to a kind of poetry? Nickel responds by explaining, there's an Englishman who just called it border blur. Webb chuckles at this, perhaps already familiar with British poet Don Sylvester Guedar, also known as DSH, who coined the term. Nicol explains that border blur reaches into all the areas, crossing over into all the arts, to in fact, to in effect, dissolve boundaries between linguistic, visual, sonic, and performative modes of creative expression. It may at first seem ironic that Nicol connects his and this is practices to the terminology of Englishmen, one who might conjure visions of Canada's ongoing colonial legacy. However, border blur, as Nicol describes it, refuses traditional poetry's conventions and it undermines the conceptual solidity of national borders. 
This it agrees with Nichol. An earlier in the episode locates the work within a global movement, suggesting that the point of border blur is to draw off the borders, like those poets he notes, publishing in Brazil, Belgium, England, Holland, Japan, and Scotland. It's not just a Canadian trip, he contends. This it further emphasizes his suspicions of nationalism by pointing out that literature doesn't mean long live the empire, literature is words. By invoking border blur, both poets articulate their poetics as distinctive and formally inventive and locate their work within a broader international network of avant-garde practitioners. The book examines this strain of avant-garde activity and complicates long-standing narratives describing Canadian poetry as an expression of Canadian national identity. So I reflect upon this episode of extension for the ways it highlights three central considerations of, of this book. Firstly, it tidily introduces some of the terms that I'm interested in and that animate the project. Poetry, nation, media, um, and avant-gardism. And working through these interlocking terms as I do in the preceding sections of the book, I take up the idea of border blur, try to understand it um, as a poetic that allows me to understand the central characteristics and concerns that emerged under its immediate usage and also how that idea formulated a network of like-minded poets in Canada. This is important to note since border blur is no longer really a term in vogue. We don't hear it so often. A uh, few poets today would use it to describe their work, um, even though many still fold their poetics into other artistic forms. And included in this group, we could, the list could go on, but we could include Jordan Abel, uh, Gary Barwin, Stephen Kane, Wade Compton, Adina Karasik, Kai Kello, Emma Reze Phillip, Kate Sikosi, Danny Spinoza, and others were all working within an expanded field. Secondly, this episode of Extension introduces one of the main contentions that I investigate in the book. This statement against borders highlights how these poets use the term border blur to not only distinguish their poetic work, but to announce their cosmopolitan outlook. As they note, the poets borrowed the term from British poet Waydar, thereby positioning themselves as Canadians who, by virtue of their poetic and its connection to an international context, complicate notions of poetry as an expression of national identity. Finally, but most importantly, the episode introduces the relationship between two of the book's principal figures, Bissett and Nicol, and the contextual environment within which they created and published. I position them as two main actors whose poetries uh, embody a set of common presumptions around which many other poets gathered in Canada. Some of these like-minded writers and artists include David Alward, Sean Basmajian, Judith Copperthorne, Brian Mandora, Paul Dutton, Roy Kiyuka, Steve McCaffrey, Susan McMaster, Penn Kemp, John Riddell, Anne Rosenberg, um, Jerry Shikatani, David W., and others, all of whom make an appearance in the book because they share an interest in dissolving boundaries that separate creative fields. So to locate poets under a single banner, I admit, uh, may be more expedient than necessarily precise, but they are united by a network of small presses, little magazines, and performance spaces that distinguish them from the majority of the writers in Canada at the time. Taken together, they form an avant-garde network of or what I'm calling an avant-garde <coughs> network of affiliation that developed an alternative vision for poetry and its production in Canada, one that exceeds the traditional page-based work that dominated the literary mainstream in the second half of the 20th century. This book begins to tell the story of how this network of Canadian poets came to be connected by a shared poetics. And I think I'll leave it there. wanted to, to hear more, you could buy the book, but where it comes. <laughs> um, um, but like I said, if, if you do want to purchase a copy, you're welcome to, get, to jump on the list. So now I think we're going to move on to what we're all really here for, which is the poets, the poets themselves. Um, and I'd like to now invite our first reader for the evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to ask my friend Danny Spinoza to, to read for us. She is a poet of digital and print media, and she is a software engineer. She has published several chapbooks of poetry, several more peer-reviewed journal articles on poetry, one long scrawling book, and one pink poetry book. <laughs> I, 
I've had to deliver that bio several times, and it feels good every time. I love that. Um, but not only was it important for me to have Danny here uh, reading tonight, uh, because she's my friend and her excellent work appears in the conclusion of Border Blur, but, and I don't know how many people know this, but soon Danny won't be a Toronto resident, so I wanted her to be here to celebrate her. Sorry if I let the cat out of bed. Um, but I wanted to make it known that I want Danny here, I want to celebrate her and her work um, and everything that she is as she embarks on a new chapter. So it's my great honor to ask you to welcome my dear friend, uh, Danny Spinoza. Really just some good time. 
uh, oh, and I love the valley for your response. You can tell a lot about a person by the gifts that they give. My brother-in-law, for example, insists on passing on the same piece of clay over and over, even though the reception is neutral at best. It's just that he's got so much of it, and it's funny, and it's useful, if he keeps giving it away. My love sacrifices our best aged cheeses just to marry the artist. Her silly wooden sculpture sickens me. It makes me regret the time I spent in the basement moving from barrel to barrel. I research. I find out everyone's favorite thing. But that doesn't surprise you. I'm always reaching out for more information. A wiki of each of us. This is not a single player game anymore. It can't be. No, not since we all realized, and quickly, that making a home is a lot fucking easier when there are many of us. And there are so many of us which is good, because there's so much to do. Still, this is all a mockery. A playing at the work, us two over here sockless on the couch, or your lover's eyes over your shoulder while you try your best to get each and every berry bush. You can tell a lot about a person by what their goal is, when the game is goalless. Sure, there's something about this place that appeals to our tidy grad school neuroses <laughs> that we want to fill in all the blanks, complete collections, but we don't have to. We can spend the day just giving gifts, walking the full distance from the beach to the river and back, noting the different plants, nodding at the way the street bends, comparing this stone to that stone for the sake of each's stoniness and our ability to cradle them in our palms as if they were eggs. It's taken me really just a little time out of the city, just a tad, to realize how much I've been playing this game of productivity, of product. Trying to appease the ghostly patriarchs who loom in the background, all our benevolent dead daddies who smile upon us and bestow gold stars. <laughs> and if we're being honest here, and I think we are. I don't know what is left for me in this place anymore. Except y'all. The universities have canceled all my contracts. And they closed my favorite fishmonger. <laughs> Plus I'm too old now to know where the good raves are. And still I think too young for bingo yet. I know it makes you sad, and I'm sorry, but on Monday, I will walk from the beach to the river and back to my house, and I'm not going to make a goddamn thing. <laughs> my pleasure to introduce to you um, virtually uh, Penn Kemp. Uh, Penn Kemp has been celebrated as a trailblazer since her publication of poetry by Coach House, uh, publishing Bearing Down in 1972. Um, 1972 is also 
um, her first sound poetry performance at the League of, at the League of Poets in Edmonton. Um, Bearing Down expressed the vocal labor of, of childbirth to the dismay of some elder poets uh, and the appreciation of others. This month, her multimedia work incrementally was released as audio on Bandcamp by Angry Starlings uh, and as text by Hem Press, including the trip, which you'll hear a recording of in just a moment. Um, Penn's work has been translated into many languages and as London, Ontario's inaugural poet laureate, her project was the DVD Luminous Entrance, a sound opera for climate change action. She's performed at festivals in Europe, Brazil, India, and North America, including 1980 Sound Poetry Festival in New York. Delighting in multimedia collaborations, Penn is a longtime participant and advocate for sound poetry. Penn unfortunately could not make the trip to Toronto for the launch, but she kindly agreed to record uh, a few short performances of her readings uh, that I'll share with you now. Um, so two of the recordings are Penn solo, and she sent me a follow-up recording, which is sort of a, a different version of one of the works, but with added accompaniment uh, from Gary Barber. So we're going to play those three videos, and, and Gary's here tonight. So thank you, Gary, for doing that. I am so delighted to be with you virtual, with a virtual Steve from London Haunts, since I can't meet you with you. Live on August 18th, but here is to celebrating over here. Thanks to Chuck Schmaltz and hi to all of the sound boards and boards right there. I given the subject matter of the APs, I'm going to perform two poems for you. One of which is in the uh, new incrementally, which is coming out in two days on August the 18th from Hem Press with the uh, Angry Starlings. Label. So it will be Angry Starling for the evening. And this poem I was originally published in Animus by Hidden Press. The trick is to act as if 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 is able to act as if the truth to act as if passive is able to act as if the truth to act as if passive is able to act and active might if active with all like oh now is also of a vintage stated from 1976 <laughs> in France then, and Rick Simon protested the cover and uh, it's a piece called Bone and Bone. <laughs> Okay, quick, 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 quick,
Sabbath common sounds, common sounds, common sounds, common sounds, common sounds. Do these bones live? Sounds, common sounds, common bones, 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 common bones,
One senses sonnets not sent to test. See no, see no noose set. Sees no noose set. No nonsense. No set oneness. One senses untaunt. Not tense tones. No sonnets set to tote so. Tense not testes on notes to one's taught. Noon noses on to set sun set on. One not seen to toss. Stone sonnet net. This is a subgenre of poetry that I don't see much of anymore, it's, um, which is the found poem. And this is a found poem, well, it's a found poem. I might as well say it in advance instead of the end. There's a note to it. From a caption to a figure in Wilder Penfield and P. Perrault's The Brain's Record of Visual and Auditory Experience is found on a page in Oliver Sacks is the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Reminiscence. A voice, 
voices, one voice, a familiar voice, a familiar voice, a voice, a voice, a voice, a voice, familiar music, a voice, a familiar voice, a familiar voice, familiar music, voices, voices, familiar music, familiar music, familiar music, familiar music, familiar music, familiar voice, familiar music, familiar music. Sound of feet walking, familiar voice, voices, music, voices, familiar sound, a voice, a voice, voices, voices, a voice, a voice, music, a voice, familiar voice, familiar voices, dog barking, music, a voice, familiar voice, a voice, familiar voice, familiar voice. Familiar music, a voice, voices, 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 familiar voice, familiar voice, familiar voice, music, familiar voice, familiar voice, familiar voice, familiar music, familiar music, familiar music, voices. with uh, uh, a sample, and um, it's an ongoing sequence. Uh, I used to number them, but I've lost completely lost track of the, the numbers. <laughs> so I think it's around, well, you'll hear in the title. The title of this is uh, Imsro number 121.
said everything that's been on our mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's our first set. Um, I think we'll take a short 15 minute break. Did that feel like a, a very good first set? Woo! I thought so. I felt, I felt it. I felt it. I felt like a very, very good first set. And I think we're in store for a very, very good second set. Um, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you our next performer for the evening. Uh, we have Brian Dora, who sent me a Brian, Brian sent me a bio that was too short, so I expanded it. <laughs> and then I will tell everyone, but Brian's is far too short. Um, so Brian and Dora, as many of you know by now, graciously permitted, uh, gave me the permission to use uh, his visual poem, Crap, as the cover art for Border Blur Poetics. So that beautiful cover image that we have, that beautiful cover, is, is really thanks to Brian. So Brian, thank you for, for giving me that permission. I think it really captures the spirit of the book. It's a lovely work. As soon as uh, I was thinking about cover images, I remember you giving me that at Meet the Presses, uh, I think it was in 2017, just after my birthday. Uh, it was a birthday gift that you gave me. Are we I'm not sure what we're applying for. <laughs> Let's do it. Part of Victoria. 
Um, and I had a dream one night, woke up and thought, geez, this is like home all by itself. So I started writing this and adding to it, and it would go from one page to four pages and down to a haiku, and I'd build it all back up again. Meanwhile, I am not sending in a poem weekly to this class, right? So when I finally think it's ready, I hand it in, and we all look at it, and Skelton uh, looks at me and says, where were you born? And I said, uh, Vernon, B.C. in Hill County Valley. And the fucker scoffed at me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the first indication that, um, about oppressive and gatekeepers, etc. What I really wanted to do when I finished was uh, get my butt to Trumbo, uh, leave BC, leave my family, get out of it. So um, I arrived in Toronto September 1969. I have a portable typewriter, books, papers, my camera, two sets of clothes, and 200 bucks. I walk up from the bottom of Down Street and I found a job just north of St. Clair. Um, <laughs> Part of that, as I walked up Elm Street, I saw and saw the Parkside. Uh, Parkside was one of the most notorious gay bars in the city, uh, and I loved it. Um, the Parkside, and as, as Eric has said in the book, and I, I just read it, and I'm surprised how perceptive he was. The Parkside was a place where you met your friends, you could hook up, drink beer, listen to music, shoot books. Um, got shit on by the establishment, but it was also a surveillance system. Um, you could, if you went down to the washrooms, you could get caught. Um, it was also the easiest way to provide a vice budget, police budget, because there was always somebody going to be reaching out to touch you. So one night I met a, um, a guy outside the, the bar at closing time, and we went home. And we tried a relationship for about a year and a half. That's usually when the fantasies are really all gone. Um, and it just, just fucking blows right up. It's just a, a horrible, horrible, miserable, sad mess. But I, something in me broke, seriously broke. Um, and I went into a nosedive major. I, still, I couldn't write. Uh, it was getting dark, like, you know, my whole world, whatever. Um, until one day I was sitting in the bar side, bar side having a beer, and a friend, Bob, this is me, I won't tell you his last name. Bob started talking in a way that just reached inside. It was just the most amazing feeling, like to listen to somebody talk like this. And he, he was talking about being in touch. He was talking about how your unconscious is just a whole lot closer than maybe somebody else who's not in touch. Not good or bad, just this is the way it's happening with you. Um, things got worse. Um, I, I found a little apartment up in Walker Street, Walker Avenue, that's what it's called, third floor, uh, by myself, and it was getting darker. So I contacted Bob and said, Bob, I'm, I'm in trouble. So Bob said maybe he needs some therapy. And I belong to this group called Therapists. Um, I thought, OK. Um, I went. I had an interview with Lee Hindley Smith, the, the, the woman who actually founded Therapists. But when I went, I thought Sarah Fields was a, was a woman. And it was in a way. But her name was Sarah. And her last name was Fields. So, when I actually met her, and she was talking about how one life goes around and around, and there's never a direction, there's never some kind of completion, because it's just swirling. Uh, and she said to me, well, do you think you can do this? And I said, well, I don't know. And she said, that's the right answer, because <laughs> we don't know. So um, I got into therapies, and there were three major, major gains of my going into therapy. Uh, there was the first of all, this, the therapeutic aspect. And I began, the very first thing we began to work with was um, a 
kind of a, a, a visual judgment. It's called ocular malice. Uh, and I really own this. I look at it, oh, look at those fucking slides. Oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, and I was right into this, right? So that was our first major, let's punch it up and get, get that over with. The next one, of course, is Dear Old Dad. Um, this is where what I told you about Parkside and what you're going to hear about Dad begins to show a pattern. Um, dear old Dad, who would call me panty waist or gorilla, depending on the mode, um, and then be totally affable, and then wham, he'd hit you again with these fucking names, name calling. I mean, I know I was a different kid, so that was part of it. Not all okay so far, but I am now digging up the shit. The shit is coming out, <laughs> and I'm digging, and I, I, and I am no longer defensive in my therapy. I am intrigued about getting the shit out. Just keep digging. However, there was also a secondary game. That secondary game was I met writers who were there. I met B.P. Nickel, of course, uh, Dutton. I met uh, Roberto Rivera uh, uh, and uh, McCaffrey, John Rydell, Richard Chula, Mike Dean, later Shikitani and Bissett, uh, Sailor. Um, also, at that time, uh, everything was going and gearing towards the 11th International Sound Poetry Festival, October 78. And it was a, an unbelievable event for me, for everybody who attended, really. Uh, there were people from France, uh, Henri Chopin, Bernard Heitzig. There was uh, Stan uh, from Sweden. There was uh, Totino from Italy. There was uh, all the guys from Britain, uh, Americans, Canadians, Owen Sound, Four Horsemen of Court. Uh, this was a complete blow up for me. This was like everything I'd ever dreamed about getting something out, being able to take what was there and move it out in an artistic and communicative way began to happen. Um, 1976. Uh, Nickel has told me that you could take the Xerox of a Xerox and it gets bigger. And I thought, oh, fuck, what can I do with this? Because the things were beginning to break now. Some of the therapy was clearing the shit out. I had time for creative energy. So I began thinking about this. And now, do you remember that dream poem that the, the skeletonic asshole didn't like? Well, I found it in my notes, and I looked at it and thought, God damn, that really looks like a good visual. This, this could actually work. So I did a Xerox and a Xerox and a Xerox until all of those was just fragmented. Then I brought it up just about to readability and shrunk it down to a postage stamp. And I called it the dream. And it works out, you know, here you can read it to one point, almost read it, and there at the very beginning is just a pattern of scratches to where you end, right here, at a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. That was the dream. <laughs> the first place you can get. Uh, it says on the back here, it says, squeezed and pressed in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> the best part, okay, um, there were a lot of small presses that were working prior to Underwich Editions. That came much later. Um, Phenomenon Press was run by Richard Truller and John Rydell. Uh, and they had a, a magazine, if you will, called Compacta. Uh, they took the Dream as the third uh, issue of Volume 1 and distributed it. This is all done by subscription. Uh, so the book was out. Thrilling, the book is out. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a whole lot of people talking about pre-verbal and breath, and breath pauses, and breath punctuations, right? Uh, the three space in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a piece that would signal a breath take. Okay? So I got thinking about that. And I had, you know, I had a little studio I rented and if I could just, you know, do things. Um, I had a bunch of what they call canary paper. You probably don't know what it is. It's a cheap newsprint painted yellow, colored yellow. 
And I was in the studio one day, and everybody was talking, and this thing about rest was going out of my head, and I thought, I wonder if you could draw it. So I had a big fat pencil that, you know, you have when you're in grade school, and I had this paper, and I go, And I would, I would draw, I just keep drawing. And I don't know how many, there's, there's 40 of them or something. Uh, well, I chose uh, six of them, and I called it a posteriori. Um, and it, it works, and I began to realize how this works, that you can do almost anything as a middle, a classic middle, and sandwich it, and it will make sense. So I have here, as if words reach wave two, but felt, and then all these drawings, right? Then I sandwiched it with a little notation here. These tracings of breath at the time of exhalation translate as movement prior to the word, as that power or force that through throat and nostril pushed in ways and means that words could only, de only delineate, circle around, and in the process interrupt that space <coughs> where the word lies, not unspoken, but unformulated as breath and body, pulse and being a priori. Now, if you think everything happened in the 70s, <laughs> um, <laughs> you would be wrong. Um, one day, uh, Kate Siklossi comes over to visit, and we're rummaging through uh, my archival boxes, and uh, Hawkeye, I tell you, Hawkeye <laughs> spots this. This is a little <clears throat> booklet that I made, um, and I think, I've been thinking, what date, what date? No date, no name, right? Um, talk about border work. Um, <laughs> so Kate looks at it and says, oh, well, we can do this as part of our mentors. Uh, so they go out and they Xerox it, and they get construction paper, and they start working on this <coughs> on the table in Kate's place, gluing and doing this, that, and the other. When I started thinking this a couple weeks ago, I thought, yeah, <coughs> there was Kate and Danny, and they were beatering away. I thought, maybe not beatering. Maybe I should. <laughs> 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 like it. like it. So, at the time, also, while all this was going on, <laughs> other than three um, I am working at, I have a job at uh, the Isis Gallery. I got a job there uh, after the big blow up, the screaming and crashing of dishes in the gay affair. Um, the, I need to go find some work, I need to find a place to blah, 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 blah. And I had so bad, and I'm not going to tell you how dark and dry, I only had one job on a Friday night. I needed to get, you know, something to do, uh, like money. However, that on Friday night, I was told that there was an opening at the Isis Gallery. The Isis Gallery in the 70s, 80s was just the biggest thing that hit Toronto. It was an incredibly important part. Uh, and they had an opening for a fitter. A fitter that takes all that stuff, puts it in a frame, mat, glass, cleans it, wraps it up, out it goes. And so I walked in, I needed some curves. So I hit the park side of the floor, I had a couple of beers, walked in and met Ab Isaacson. He said, well, why should I hire you? And I said, because I'm really fast. Um, so my first, my first day, so I'm coming in just prior to Christmas. I'm being hired about December 1st or something. And so I look at the orders that are on the table, and they're dated for October. Uh, that's about far behind the order. So I get to work, I set up the place, I do this. I finish 31 pieces in one day. Al comes in on Tuesday, because Al Gallery to close Monday. And says to the foreman, um, well, how's the new guy? Stan says, 31 pieces in one day? I had a job. <laughs> um, also, frames. I had a really great conversation with Robert Croach about frames. Because he said to me, he said, well, frames, you make frames. I said, yeah, I do. He said, Christ, you can just take frames and put them anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did. So, um, but also, it was the camera. You know, 
I'm ca camera, it, it, I'm composing, I'm seeing, blah, blah. So all that starts working. Um, so, order work. Um, the pattern that I, I tried to show from Skelton to my father uh, to the parkside is a matter of you can get slapped any time, but you can also have a bit of freedom. So when I work, uh, my first inkling of, of, of something's going to happen or I want to do is met with sometimes mild apprehension and sometimes with absolute rank fear. And it is that fear factor that is the surveillance. That is the thing that I'm going to have to go through to get to what I want to do. And what I want to do is, like framing, get my hands on it. Can I wring this? Can I wrench it? Can I rip it? Can I, can I do something with this, right? Um, there is a, there's a photographer who said, urge, plan, action, sight, documentation. And that's sort of what happens. But what really happens, what really happens with me, after I've worked through that fear, and I begin to start to twist something, to play, what happens is the world goes away. And Brian comes out to play. <laughs> Thank you. seems suiting um, because in, in Border Blur I, I talk a little bit about uh, Jerry's performances and oftentimes he would do a, a false finish and the lights would go out and he would leave the room and leave people guessing and so I was guessing I didn't know if, if, if Jerry would be here this evening or not but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he is. <laughs> Jerry Shikatani's art making has included publishing, performing, and exhibiting his poetry, prose, and visuals. Creating original specials for CBC radio and film collaboration with internationally renowned filmmaker Phil Hoffman. Their Kokoro is for the Heart Received Best Film Award at the Athens International Film Festival in 2000. A freelance journalist of travel, sports, and especially gastronomy, he's respected nationally and internationally for his work as a restaurant critic over four decades. Heading his many achievements, he points to the 1981 Coach House published Paper Doors, an anthology of Japanese-Canadian poetry co-edited with translator David Albert, English or Japanese language poets from three generations breaking the linguistic constraints of the definition of Canadian literature. Based half-time in Spain, he has created there Lorca's Granada Writing Retreat and Colloquium for Artists. For his focus writing on Spain, especially its world-leading cuisine, he was decorated under the seal of the King of Spain into the highest order for non-Spanish nationals, La Cruz de la Orden del Merito Civil. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Jerry Shikatani. <laughs>
that you are chop, 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 To cut short, measure the words, weight of this, vu, these, uh, this, one face, fasa fas, the one, la, long, the long parole, in the skin, this, they, here, this, one face, fasa fas, la un, la long, the long parole, in the skin, on liberté, conditionnel, continual, this, they, here, the core déchiré, encore emprisonné, prison, the core of body speech, être en présence. situations here in the context culturally of um, what we call uh, the avant-garde, avant-garde works or alternatives towards uh, the main, mainstream poet, poetic scene. Uh, and in that case, I'll just, just briefly mention, um, after a very short time at, at university, I uh, started, uh, entered into the poetry scene in Toronto. That would have been in sort of right after 1960, 1970. At that time, uh, you know, I really wasn't kind of aware, but in a sense, the, the plain fact was is that, that for a number of years, uh, for a few years anyways, I was the only non-white uh, poet in various poetry groups that I was in. But I was welcomed terrifically in by various kinds of poetry scenes in Toronto. And um, one of the things that I came with uh, was my own kind of uh, reading and, and exposure to art from, because during the teen, my teens, I was going to places like um, uh, Isaac Siala and then Carmen Lamana and uh, listening to new music and um, certainly, uh, certainly kind of minimalist art was uh, something I was interested in. And um, in that time, I think what I, what I realized was that for me, um, the normal kind of way of scripting and inscribing poetry and then publishing it um, wasn't always satisfactory to uh, to the, to what I found was the important auditory and, and or, uh, oral dimension of silence, and I think for I'm, I started to meet a number of people like Paul and of course uh, Michael Dean is here, um, people who sort of uh, sort of really responded really well to this aspect of when I loved their work that uh, they reciprocated and that's how I entered in the community always as a, as a soul, um, but that community was really important. Uh, so I would, much like this time, although this was really small silences, I would do very extended silences to do justice to the kind of uh, positive and negative uh, combined space within the body that uh, really is about the kind of silence that occurs uh, and to be faithful to the writing process to that idea of um, ellipsis to uh, uh, moving from one image to the, to the next uh, with no logical consequences but creating a kind of empty space of silence and abruptness and hesitation was something that was not being conveyed and so that's what I, I started to bring that more and more. Um, during that time and I, you know, I profited immensely from this community, uh, you know, again, Paul and Brian and people like that, uh, with their, uh, with the events they held and um, uh, among those, I mean, again, people uh, such, such, such as Tom Rowett was here. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly for me, in terms of linguistics, uh, and or language anyways, is the fact that um, prior to the rest of Canadian, Canadian culture, those who command it and try to define it, uh, were even interested in Quebecois poetry, and especially something like Nicole Brassard. People like Nicole Brassard and uh, uh, Michael Delisle, um, 
a whole slew of writers connected with Kochas, um, and they ended up coming to, um, performing here uh, in Toronto. And uh, as uh, Brian talked about those at the International Sound Poetry Festival, and prior to that, one of the persons was Bernard Heitzig. And um, so I saw him once when he came as a solo reader and then part of the festival. And I was really impressed with Bernard. And because for me, my root was um, that I had two, two different kind of languages, uh, obviously born and schooled in English, but what I call a life comes to define as maternal tongue or umbilical language, which is one that you, you get from birth and you hear your lullabies, you hear the rhythms, and you hear the way of defining your sensory perceptions. That was in Japanese. And uh, you know, it's very difficult to reconcile those two things, but people, other people um, you know, uh, in other languages, come from other language uh, communities, also grow up with those kinds of things. And the question is how to enunciate those or just put that and inscribe that into a poetic form, because what happens is that there are actual breaks of meaning for some people. Uh, because you're, you're flipping from one language to another, but writing it in English, um, and sometimes it's really insufficient. In Japanese, for instance, it's often very insufficient to uh, talk about sensory things, pain and, uh, and itchiness and all those kinds of things. Uh, everyday things, and, you know, they're, they're, they're the quotidian. So Heisek, who appeared here, was a great, you know, the great master of Paris, and he performed at the contact of foreign writers and performance series. And this time, I, I, I was also making radio programs at CBC, writing scripts, editing, cutting reel-to-reel -reel tape the old-fashioned way, uh, and producing soundtracks. And with Heidsick, what he ended up doing, he used pre-recorded -pre tape like this, and he had two different tracks. And I found for myself, that was kind of the ways in which I could sort of um, articulate also the, the various uh, semblances within languages because they are constant that you can do that and then you can move from one to the next. Um, I, I normally use three or four. Um, these days this was mainly English and French. And, but Heidsick had devised this me me method where I thought there was a real a sculptural collage form of language realities that were going on in doing this because it was not just listening to one track or the other. It was a combination of the two and how silence also entered into those spaces. Um, I was very lucky after that to uh, live and spend much time in Paris in the 80s, and it became really clear that uh, you know, it was a very personal friendship, but you know, it was an unstated mentoring for, for me because I became uh, good friends with uh, Bernard and his wife, the artist, uh, Francois Janicol, and so a lot of my processes uh, evolved out of that. Um, so you know, that I want to always make sure I mention that um, these things that came to me really through Bernard's brilliant, brilliant work and my time in, in Paris, which is really extraordinary. Uh, again, as Paul Dutton knows, because Paul is just so loved in France and Paris and performs there so much, is that uh, the extraordinary community there of sharing uh, and performances going on off in different places in Europe. Uh, and that's something that you know, I was able to at least appreciate for some a few years over the years. And um, I guess that's really pretty much what I want to say, but it, it's, it's the importance of, for me of this fact that when I, having come here uh, as a poet, in, born and raised in Toronto, but uh, that, that I had an extraordinary community that I worked with, and, uh, and the influence that impacted me, which has taken me afield and afar now, um, always will come back to those influences that happen by this community of poets who are here, the ones from Therapy as a horseman, um, because I really start to see and understand how they shared, and they shared because they were looking for uh, not one definition of poetry, but, the, but truly the possibilities of poetry and the possibilities of art making. And for me that became so important, and uh, anyway, so that's pretty much uh, you know, all I, I really need to say, and I have to say, but I, I appreciate the time. And I appreciate very much Eric for uh, <laughs> I decided to go back to the 70s and 80s and time, mid 80s when I was in Paris, um, because he, it was from the, uh, the wonderful book that is out there, uh, Performance Art in O Canada, uh, that, uh, that he had sort of seen a few of the notes of my performances and, and, and then we started the email thing as he interviewed me by email 
uh, which is a great joy. And then uh, knowing that this has come out and to really celebrate this period that he's done, um, you know, I, I congratulate him, I thank him for that too. Uh, I think a lot of us thank him for doing that because it was an important period. <laughs> Coming through, I don't know. Hey, look up. 
see the stuff of dancing face to me. And moving through the desert fire and the holy. A mountain coming through your mouth and coming through your heart. A coming through your breath and coming through your being. I got a feeling, honey. We're going to make this thing stronger. And the green wind is moving up through the summer tree. And the green wind, the wind, the wind is moving to the summer tree. And the green wind is moving up to the summer tree. Hey, Black River, move to us. We are the river, moving to the summer tree. And the green wind, yeah, honey, is moving to the summer tree. Up to the summer tree. Up to the summer tree. Shama, oh, shere, ha, shere. I see shama, na, ha, shere, shama, na, ha, shere. Oh, you put shama, na, ha, shere, shere. Oh, shama, ha, shere, ha, shere, ha. Oh, you put shama, na, ha, shere, shere. You fell from the sky, in from the sea. I swam into my hands, I was there for you. But what is the time? For what the season? Was there a reason I was there for you? Push him in a heart, or you push him in a heart, I Uh-huh. Was there a time? Was the season? Uh-huh. But what was the reason you were there for me, honey? It's from the day a night on time. Touching the air, you were there for me. The ship of our lives, it sailed forever. In from the sea, honey, you were there for me. Hey, I see a shimmer on a hierarchy. You shimmer on a hierarchy. Oh, shimmer on a hierarchy. I see a shimmer on a hierarchy. I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream, honey, I dream of northern eyes. I dream of northern eyes. I dream, I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream, I dream, I dream. The silver, the silver mirage. Yes, 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 it's changing, it's changing. Always like silverware, we, we polish, burnish the vases so responsive to our touching and rubbing. So many, many memories to still transform with tending, elliptical. They're always often becoming transient, golden, Dots dissolving and changing in the molecular tapestry. Wait, there's been a change, of course. My brain is changing. It's bigger now, almost too big for my skull, which is stretching to accommodate, contain its cerebella, a growing, the almost disappearing role of narrative in some of these realms, encircling an overwhelming less and less, they're changing into the continuing strands of 
orchestrations we carry and distilling the edges of almost anything, parading, parading, through, through, and by a years and years of interaction, years of less so burnishing until almost golden, every molecule is seeming shine and helps light our path through the snow. Pushana, Pushamba, Pushana, 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 when I was a boy in Alabama, I was barely eight foot two, and I ate all the crocodiles that they had there till there was nothing left for me to do. So I moved up north, further up north to New York City, and I ate all the crocodiles they had left. <laughs> and the full moon, it hung so deep in my chest, and I was all so bereft that I turned to the writing, like everyone else here, of poetry for the good of our souls and our lives. <laughs> And the green wind is moving up through the summer tree. And the green wind is moving to the summer tree. And the green wind is moving up through the summer tree. And he dug, he dug a, a long, a long pathway through the ice and snow. I could barely walk then, and I carried me through it onto this platform he made of the ice. It was 35 below, and I sat there on this ice platform, and I looked at everything, the silver bridge, all our lives, all the ice, all the snow. I could feel the breathing of every creature everywhere. And I thought, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And then they brought me barbecue chicken dinner. <laughs> it was like, it was so amazing. And I sometimes dream of all that. And I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream of northern skies. I dream. Thank you very much. <laughs>
contender for the evening with Lena thing. Um, I also want to thank my partner Alicia and Kate.